and welcome to another episode of Apocalypse Talk. Today I thought we'd do something a little bit different. Today is for all you car nerds who like to play the long drive because you like the cars in it. We're going to talk a little bit about them. Okay. So, let's start with the car that we find through this door. And today the garage loads in with a Trabant. T-R-A-B-A-N-T. Now, I am a car guy, but I had no idea that these things even existed, really, until recently. I saw an episode of James May's Cars of the People, and that was the first time I'd really seen a Trabant and known anything about it. They're also nicknamed the Trabi. Now, Trabant, the name, comes from uh, Satellite, which, uh, because this car was debuted in 1958, officially, um, it was named after Sputnik. It was kind of the Sputnik-inspired car, right? Because this car was produced in uh, East Germany uh, by uh, car produ producer VEB. I think I'm getting it right. Somebody's probably going to tell me I'm wrong or I mixed up the number, the letters in the acronym. But in any case, produced in East Germany, uh, named after the Sputnik satellite. It doesn't get much more communist than this ride right here. And that is for a bunch of reasons. For one thing, when they started designing the Trabant, it was meant to be a three-wheeled bicycle car. But fortunately for everyone, uh, they, they decided to upgrade, right? Give it three wheels. Now, in the game, see how there's no rust on the body of the car? That's because the game actually is true to the original uh, design specs of the car. The car originally, well, the, all the Trabants, made from 1957, I think, officially, all the way up until, um, when was it, 1991. Yeah, 3.7 million Trabants uh, built between 1957 or 8 and 1991, the final production year. No coincidence that 91 was the final production year. That was about 11 months after the fall of the wall between East and West um, Germany. And so uh, within months, really, of that, the reunification of Germany, the Trabant stopped being manufactured because apparently its uh, manufacturing process was super work intensive. Like the, the East Germans had never bothered to really make it an efficient car to produce. That's in part because of the communist values of um, making sure everybody has a job. So you don't bother making things super efficient to produce. You just, you make them, you make it so that they get produced at the volume you want, and then you use as many workers as you can to do it, which is interesting, right? A little different than what we're used to in the West. So what that uh, the reason this thing won't rust, though, is because it's made of duraplast, which is which is a resin, like a, a resin byproduct of the apparently the ink and dye industry in East Germany and recycled cotton. But it's supposedly super tough. And these body panels, you know, like the life expectancy on these cars was like 28 years or something body-wise. Um, but these body panels don't rust. So in this game, if I picked up one of these wire brushes and used it on this thing, it could only make it worse. The wire brush can't make this better. So we have to rely on sponges to get this car going. Right? I think I know where one is. Now... The Trabant is a fascinating car for a bunch of reasons. We're going to shine up. <laughs> Let's see if I can remember the, the commands in this game, right? We're going to shine up this body a little bit. Just get ourselves a gander of this green paint. Now, this is the paint we find on this one. This green is a kind of an unusually bright paint for these Trabants. They were known for some pretty dull colors. Uh, and I suppose you can, you know, blame East Germany for that. Figuring, you know, gray is good enough, right? <laughs> uh, okay. We're going to grab ourselves another sponge. I know where there's more. That's right. All you have to do is come up here. Um, walk across this little gangway. You have to crouch down. Should be able to grab that one. Okay. 
<laughs> no harm done. So what we have here, what we're looking at, is the uh, Trabant 601, which was manufactured from 1964 all the way till 1988 or 9. Um, at which point, a new Volkswagen Polo motor was sourced when uh, East and West Germany reunified. And that's when um, this thing finally got a different engine. See, interestingly, in 1957, when this was first debuted, it was actually pretty cutting edge. Car-wise, it was, it was a pretty cutting edge car because it had a um, transverse mounted engine, independent suspension, and um, you know it was a front wheel drive. Uh, these things were kind of kind of modern. Oh, and it had a unibody construction. It had a like a composite steel frame that all of these plastic, basically plastic body panels were bolted to. So um, so it was pretty fresh in 1957. The problem is it had hardly any updates in the intervening decades during which it was produced, where um, most cars you know, that you would compare it to had, oops, careful now, I don't, oh, stop, I'm trying to scratch, just the mirror, just the mirror now, right, not the door, just the mirror, not the door, just the mirror, there we go, <laughs> uh, ooh, you, look at that, Coming back, not fast though, huh? Anyway, um, so let's take a little tour of the engine bay, shall we? Now, take a look at some things. During this car's entire production run, it never had an external fuel filler flap, apparently. I mean, I think the, the um, Trabant P, what was it, 1100 that finally got a Volkswagen motor in it in the last like 11 months of its production model after decades and decades and decades of the same thing in the last 11 months it got a Volkswagen motor that made like twice the horsepower but then they just cut production altogether after that so in every model except for that one you have this gas tank on top of the engine and you fill the whole car up from here now notice something in the game we have a gas and oil mix that's because this is a two-stroke motor it's a two-cylinder two-stroke this being a P600, it is, as you can guess, 600 centimeters, right? Like a point, you know, cubic centimeters, 0.6 liters. Um, this 24 liter fuel tank is the smallest one in this game. And it's, it's uh, equivalent to something like, what was it? Six gallons US or something? I forget. It's tiny. It's tiny. So um, by US standards, six gallons is small. Uh, and the interesting thing is, the reason the fuel tank, one of the reasons the fuel tank is on top of the engine is, this engine doesn't even have a fuel pump. It doesn't have a fuel pump to pull gas to the motor. So what they do is they gravity feed the gas into the carburetor. Can you believe it? It's like a tractor, right? It's like a tractor. It's so wild. So what we have is a 23 horsepower, 0.6 liter, two-cylinder, two-stroke engine. And two-stroke means that um, it's air-cooled, too, by the way. There's no radiator in this car, and uh, and it's um, not... You can't put a radiator in this car, in this game. You can't s equip a radiator, so you can swap engines in this game. You could put a different engine in the front of this car in this game, but it's not super advisable because that engine would overheat pretty fast without a radiator in it. But... The reason this uh, has some oil in the gas on purpose is it's a two-stroke, and in two-strokes you have to mix the oil and the gas. And the owners had to do that themselves. In fact, the owners had to do everything themselves. There's no gas gauge in this car, right? I think this model might be the, um, the deluxe version. This model might have a gas gauge, actually, but the Trabant wasn't produced with a gas gauge like for a long time, and then when it finally was available, it was like a major upgrade. <laughs> People just had a dipstick. 
the the fuel cap had a dipstick so you pulled it out and you looked at the dipstick on the fuel cap to see how much gas you had in there and then you mixed the oil and the gas yourself right and um if you're wondering if that's efficient yeah actually pretty efficient it could go something like a hundred kilometers on uh on a liter it's, it's not too bad right but if you're thinking that makes this car a green car if you're thinking to yourself hey look it recycles it's got recycled bodywork um it's super small it weighed like 1300 pounds I'm like so that's that's like a half of a of a ton right i mean more than a half a ton but you, you get my meaning really light um it weighed about 1300 pounds you're thinking to yourself good on gas weighs maybe 1300 pounds it's made of recycled material it's super simple you know it doesn't involve a lot of precious metals or anything that's for sure is this a green car no we are talking nine times uh when this thing was um it, like in 2007 or something uh the typical car was putting out like nine times less hydrocarbons and five times less carbon monoxide than this thing so small yeah but just pump and smoke out the back like this thing was made to the numbers but they were not environmental ones so um some other changes that the very very last model had before i forget that p1100 or whatever that had the volkswagen polo motor in it it got uh struts instead of leaf springs um, which was kind of a major upgrade different you know wheel hubs stuff like that um, but really the Trabant remained unchanged for decades of its production run now one of the crazy things is if you had lived in East Germany at the time that these came out you would have put your name on a waiting list for one and the waiting list was something like 10 to 13 years long these things secondhand cost twice as much as the the retail figure uh, for a new one because people couldn't like stand to wait 10 years to get their car so if you had one of these for sale it was gonna fetch a pretty penny right crazy huh and here I was pitching communism in my last episode of the long drive you know apocalypse talk <laughs> I think maybe the Trabant is proof positive that I I really shouldn't shouldn't bother. <laughs> Sorry, I find that so amusing, but I do. Okay, we're gonna fill this thing up with gas. And it probably see if we just left that amount of oil in there, it wouldn't start. In this game or outside of this game, a two-stroke really does need that oil. So we're going to try to have what is called the optimum mix of 3% oil. Now this one is the wagon version. This is the only uh, two-door car in the long drive, currently anyway. But uh, but it's rare for other reasons, too. The wagon was kind of a rare variant of the Trabant. And here we have one, right? We have a wagon. Hmm, it's getting a little dark out, huh? We'll turn on some of these incredibly harsh. Oh, that's the exterior light. Okay. Well, I will find the garage light here somewhere. Tell you what, they got that whole fluorescent light glare thing down, don't they? All right, let's do ourselves a favor and put at least a kind of okay tire on these really crummy spots, huh? There we go. Won't drive so bad. Good thing we have such freakishly long arms, right? Uh. Which of these tires is total garbage? Hmm.
Is it the front? Nope. Maybe we just had one super bad tire on this thing. Because the spare was super bad too, so. Oh. Now, we can remove this rear seat for uh, bigger cargo in this thing. Right? Interestingly, the rear seats in these did not have seat belts. So we're talking about a car with made of plastic, um, with no, let's see here, it didn't even have a fuel pump, right? Gravity fed gas, uh, two stroke. It took this thing 21 seconds to get up to 60 miles an hour. 21 seconds, zero to 60. Uh, I know I shouldn't laugh, but isn't it just kind of amazing? I think so. All right. Um, so there's no water to check. And it is what it is. So what we'll do is we'll have ourselves a nice rest and we'll take this Trabant for a drive. Okay. I don't think we really need anything. I mean, there's a jerry can full of water over there, but what for, right? Okay. Hey, swanky interior. We've got a nice one. We could take out the back seat for more space, but I don't think we will. All right, gauges. What do we have? Speedometer and temperature. I guess we don't actually have a fuel gauge. All right. Um, the There was an S model, apparently, that, that came with uh, a tachometer so that you actually could know what speed your engine was spinning at. Just our mirrors. Notice how nice this thing sounds. <laughs> Being sarcastic. These were fit and finish, leaves a little something to be desired. I, I see some, some gaps, but that's probably also true to form, so. There we go. Look, it hasn't gotten hot yet. Or maybe that's a fuel consumption gauge. I don't remember exactly. Now this one's got the shifter on the steering wheel. It didn't ever get a floor shift ever until that like P1100 like final year of production where it had a Volkswagen motor in it and different suspension. Now, uh, the fact that this thing is making a lot of noise uh, but not a lot of speed is true to form. In the game here, these things have about 100 kilometer an hour, like top speed. You can go maybe 100 um, if the conditions are right. But you know, it's gonna cruise around 90 most of the time. We're, we're pushing this one though, look at that. Pushing it right up there. Now, it's a little jittery. I think I'm gonna attribute that mostly to the to the so-so tires that we've got on this. But um, you can see in the rearview mirror there, the trail of just sooty smoke coming out of the back of this car. Just, we're just killing what little environment is left here in the post-apocalypse, right? Oh, oh, okay, okay, all right, all right. Not sure this thing handles so, so great. Um, there was, there was, however, a rally ver variant, like they, they did make a rally car version of this thing. I don't know very much about it. It must have been better. They made a few versions. They made a, a topless version with a fold-down windshield, uh, kind of a Kubelwagen style, like military vehicle. And they made a civilian version of that that mostly got exported to Greece, apparently. I guess Greece will just buy anything. But, you know, these days, these cars are, um, well, okay, let's talk a little bit about their history before we get to the now, huh? Um, they, these things came to symbolize 
basically communism in East Germany. These were the face of the communist state in East Germany. And so much so that when the Berlin Wall fell and East Germans uh, were able to come over into West Germany for the first time ever, they, they did so in these Trabots that, and it was known as like the, the Trabot Trail was the road that all these Trabots were driving on to get to West Germany. And uh, they, a lot of people had to get special permits because the car emissions were so bad, they had to get special permits to even drive them into West Germany, apparently. But um, while these were kind of reviled and infamous as terrible cars with terrible build quality, um, that were kind of these miserable machines that people were forced to... Missed that building, hold on. These were kind of terrible machines, miserable machines, and people had to wait miserably long times to even get one of these, and so they were not well loved all the time. But, not surprisingly, this tiny little body, and, uh, and it's kind of plucky um, perseverance. I mean, it just kept getting made. And they weren't very reliable, but they, they were so simple that you could fix them with like baling twine and a baked potato or something, and they would keep going down the road. So people sort of slowly and begrudgingly came to admire them a little bit. All right, we got some gas. You know what we got to do, though? It's not like this is as easy as just popping open the fuel filler door on the side of the car. Now, apparently, um, oops, I, that's not good. Apparently, at the height of the Trabant's popularity, if you could call it that, uh, it was um, there were gas stations that actually pumped a pre-mixed oil and gas two-stroke mix, which must have been kind of handy. You could just, you know, pump, pump it straight out of the pump and not do what I'm having to do here, which is get the oil and gas mix balance back out. Would have been nice to find some tires here, wouldn't it? Okay, so what have we learned so far? The Trabant, uh, woefully underpowered. <laughs> um, very humble beginnings. But they did keep making them from the late 50s all the way to the end of the 80s. Even into the early 90s, which is pretty crazy. Okay. And then, as I think I mentioned in a previous episode, um, of course, when they did stop running, then uh, they didn't rust. So they just, all these Trabants sat around not rusting um, in junkyards, kind of impossible to to get rid of, kind of like plastics, right? I mean, what can you do to panels that are resin and cotton? They're not even really very readily recyclable. Um, so it became kind of a problem what to do with all the all the dead Trabants. Should we get a look at this beauty? Yeah, woo! Nice, right? But to its credit, we can go a long way on gas in this thing, and we can haul a lot of stuff in this little two-door wagon. The uh, the two doors, the wagons are are really pretty versatile. There's a lot of utility here for us if we're willing to put up with the rattle, clatter, engine noise of this thing as it scoots along. All right, I'm forgetting a lot of things about the Trabant, actually. Um, like, for example, uh, one of the other upgrades that happened over the decades was a 12-volt electric system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ran on 6 volts for a very long time. This thing's engine was a pre-war engine, apparently, uh, designed with a few small updates when it got released in the 50s, and then, um, you know, ran on 6 volts for a long, long time. But it did get 12 volt eventually, and a few other, you know, upgrades. The Trabant Deluxe had fog lights, 
fuel gauge, um, maybe a tachometer, I don't remember. Yeah, pretty deluxe, right? But uh, I suppose we can, you know, move to talking about these days. These days, the Trabant is actually sought after by collectors for a few reasons. For one, they are kind of cute, you know, and they're very iconic for both good and bad reasons. They're very iconic. Um, they're inexpensive because, you know, they're not like some ultra rare, super desirable car or something. But they have started to gain, uh, you know, a bit of a following. Different owners clubs have sprung up. There is, um, you know, there's this thing called the Trabot Parade. Uh, and, you know, cars from the 50s all the way up into the, even the 1991 model, like the final model, had a ton of interchangeable parts. Hardly anything ever changed on these cars. And in a way, that's um, kind of what we like classics for, isn't it? Uh, we, we like classics because they are nostalgic. We like classics because they harken back to, you know, a simpler time. And this car, even though it was made for like 40 years, it harkened back to a simpler time the entire during its entire production run. So it was always perhaps problematically nostalgic. But these days, it's starting to become kind of, you know, popular in a way. And did you know why run it for 40 years straight why why did east germany never green light uh any of the prototypes that were wheeled out there were tons of designs to replace this thing tons of them but every single one of the replacement designs would have required um more resources and slightly rarer materials that were in short supply and so east the east german government oops easy now the East German government never never gave any of them the green light. It wanted to keep the materials that the more advanced car would require for its Oh, okay. For its um other projects. And so the Trabant just kind of kept getting built. Oh hey look! This is the first time I've personally run across one of the flatbed gases. And yes, I will I will do a car episode on each of the cars of the long drive, okay? So, we're starting with the humblest of them all, uh, the only two-door of the game. The, well, I guess I can't call it venerable, but the, um, the nostalgic, the, uh, the prolific, the infamous Trabot. Here it is. Now you know. All right, see you in the next one.